Um, yeah, this is the first week of soteriology. Soteriology is just the study of salvation. Broad topic. Um, yeah, it could easily go four weeks or longer. There's a lot of complexity, so this is just introduction, skimming into it. Um, a number of good resources. Bishop Clisto Ware has some YouTube videos on salvation. Frederico Matthews Green, um, especially on the atonement, has some good stuff. Um, she's also, I think, has a YouTube recently on it. Uh, John Romanides, what some of you may not have heard of so much, um, has a book called Ancestral Sin. You can get it used on Amazon for 125. Or you can come over and sit on my couch and read it. It's not, I, I don't let it leave the house at that price. Um, there is no single understanding of what salvation is. This is a very complex, convoluted subject. Um, what there's agreement is that Jesus did something that we cannot do ourselves. And the incarnation, death, and resurrection somehow are the means by how this is accomplished. What we have in the New Testament, there's this Greek word sozo, the word save, that is what a lot of this focuses around. But even this word is ambiguous and used in multiple ways. Um, we're quite familiar usually with Matthew 121, who bringing forth a savior who will save us from our sins. That's oftentimes a quoted verse. But you also have John 12, 47, that God will not condemn the world, cosmos, but save the world. The same verb of save. It's also used in a much more common way of when the disciples are in the boat, feeling that they're sinking, they cry out, save us. Or Paul in Acts 27, he when He's in a shipwreck. He tells, says, unless you uh, remain in the ship, you will not be saved. He's not telling us all to go down to Griffey and sit in kayaks for the rest of our life. But so this word, we've got to be careful and not limit it to one definition. That what we think it is, we need to allow it to be sort of broad, free, in a larger sense. And there's a lot of implications here that we have to be careful with. Um, oftentimes in orthodoxy, we talk about, well, blessed Theotokos, save us. In the Greek, it's the same word. And when I first heard that coming out of a Protestant background, is like, are we trying to make Mary part of our salvation? But if we look at the word as a bad translation, that means more pray, intercede for us, and help us, it's a quite appropriate usage of it. We just can't use a word that is a broad meaning in a narrow technical meaning at all the times. As I said, there's no single agreement. Um, what I'm going to do is try to lay out a map. And as you know, there are a lot of different types of maps. You can have road maps that tell you how to get to places. You can have topographical maps that show you contours and elevations. You can have soil maps. They'll tell you what's the soil type. You can have weather maps. These are all different. It's not that one is right, one is wrong. Just some are more useful for one purpose than another. So what I'm trying to give you is in a sense is a map of salvation. And if you look at the history of salvation, you can always find some saint that found a path through the mountains that nobody else has ever been able to travel again. You can find they've traveled different places, but what I want to lay out is sort of the standard roadmap that the Orthodox Church typically will give you. There's a difference between Orthodoxy what do people, what do you people think salvation means in the general sense of Christianity? How would you define salvation? Theosis. Theosis. We'll get to that next week. Um, being preserved instead of destroyed. Okay, being preserved. 
you mean redeemed from sin and death? Redeemed from sin and death. Interesting you put both of them there. I think it's multifaceted. It's all of these things. Definitely. Definitely. Um, there, especially in the West, are a lot of bad views of salvation that we need to be careful of. Um, I remember an old hymn I heard, uh, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? This is actually more pagan than Christian. In the platonic sense of we are escaping from the world to go to someplace else. Um, orthodoxy you're going to find is different from sort of the common conceptions of pearly gates, sitting on clouds, playing harps. What you find in a lot of the common cartoon type of thinking about Christianity. In Christianity, it is not an escape from the world, it's a restoration of the world. What we're going to find is that the fall does not turn the creation into junk to be thrown away. You read Genesis, God created this good. He cares about it, and that care never disappears. In a sense, salvation is founded in God's faithfulness to his creation, of which we are a part. It's not just us being saved. It's not the creation being saved without us. It's a large project here. Um, Revelation 21.1, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. Heaven and earth, they're both a part of the creation. We don't have, in the Platonic idea, of an earth, the material that's disappearing, and this eternal heaven. In scripture, these two are tied together. And we'll find out in some strange ways they are. Because we don't trade one for the other. What we're going to find is an individual, in, invisible and the visible being remade and brought together as a one whole. God is promising restoration through his agent Israel. Romans 8, 21 and 22, because the creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. We need to start with this big view of salvation, that this is a restoration, a redoing of the creation project. Something that got derailed that God is putting back on the tracks to continue with. If you were in first century Jerusalem, the Jewish people of that time had a fairly clear idea of what salvation meant to them. They differed in details on here, but there were four key things that they saw in salvation. One, God would defeat the enemies of God and of Israel. Most of the people at that time thought the enemy was Rome. The king would return to Jerusalem. The king would cleanse and or restore the temple. And the king is seen as the Messiah. And then the king would be enthroned. This is what you find in the prophets, the day of the Lord. Different concept than what a lot of us have been used to. A lot of sort of the religious concept of being saved from our sins. There's something earthy here in this understanding. But I don't think it is less than what we have, what we hold to. I want to first deal with what is it the, what's the problem we're trying to deal with? We need to be saved from what? We need to understand what that is, and then I'm going to get into a sort of a, an outline, a way that we can approach what I see as the different parts of salvation. And then I'm going to sort of end up with a few things. Um, is salvation the forgiveness of sins or the abolition of death? 
what you were bringing up. Um, we get in Luke 5, 21, only God can forgive sins. This is part of the problem. And we have in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. At times we get this focus on sin, but at times we get more of an interconnection. Um, what you'll find is sin brings about death. And the fear of death pushes us into sinfulness. Why do we become greedy? We're afraid we're going to lose something. We're going to be diminished. Something's going to be taken away from us. Why do we get angry? Because we feel someone's taking something away from us. Our life is being threatened. Why are we afraid of illnesses? Why do we fight wars? Because we don't, we're, we're wanting to protect ourselves. Ultimately, it's a protection from death. So sin and death have this vicious cycle where the fear of death causes us to sin, sin entangles us further into death, and they go round and round and round feeding each other. It's a chicken egg type of a problem. But we'll find that it's only when we can attack both of these problems that we can really find a solution. And this to me is the key sort of touchstone of orthodox thinking about salvation. In Romans 5, 12, wherefore as by one man sinned into the world and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Yeah. Um, Howard, too, it seems that it is useful in this discussion to, which you're, you're doing to some extent, but to examine what happened at the fall. Mm -hmm. Right, because that's the, the root. That's where the problem and, comes in. Right, and, and it, it has an effect across multiple fronts. Mm -hmm. And all those fronts have to be dealt with in the solution of salvation. This is what we're being saved from. It's not just the fall, but the cycle that is kept rolling on from then and is going on. Um, Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The wages of sin is death, but now it's talking about life. It's not, the key thing is not a forgiveness of sins. These are tangled. And to try to, I'm not going to try to get a sequence of which one came first, which is the chicken, which is the egg. But I, I want you to get this feeling that there's a, a complex tangled knot here that we need to undo. Romans 7, 11, for sin taking occasion by the condemnation deceived me and by it has slew me. Or James 1, 13, then when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin and sin when it is finished brings forth death. Or we get in Hebrews 9, 28. So Christ was offered to bear the sins of many, and to them that look for him, he shall appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Sin is being hooked into the solution. How are we that are dead to sin live any longer? In Romans 6, 21, sin brings death. Um, the servants of sin need not just forgiveness, but we need liberation. It's a liberation from this entanglement. One of the key things is very strong in Western mindset is the idea of original sin. Orthodoxy does not believe in original sin. Original sin is this idea that Adam and Eve sinned, and Augustine is the one um, back someone in the 300s. He struggled with this problem of how can an infant die if sin causes death, how can an infant who's not yet 
volitionally sinned, how can they die? And his conclusion is that we inherit the guilt of sin. The other key problem that Augustine dealt with is he does an interesting translation of Genesis 1.17. In most of King James, in most of what we say, on the day that you eat of the fruit, you will die. Passive. Augustine made it active. On the day that you eat of the fruit, I will kill you. Death is not the consequences of sin. Death is a punishment sent by God for sin. This is key. You'll find this very much tied into Western theology of the Westminster Confession, one of the main confessions that comes out of Calvin's um, and the Reformation thinking. The punishments of sin in this world are either inward or outward, as the curse of God upon the creatures for our sakes, together with death itself. Or the Catholic Baltimore Catechism talks about God's wrath and death being the punishment for sin. You're going to find in Orthodoxy, we have a problem with this idea of God punishing for sin. We see much more that death is the consequences, that what we inherit is not the guilt of sin, but death, which is the result of sin. If you catch that issue, there's a number of things that we can untangle easily. And John Romanini's is the best one to get into untangling this. This is the problem that a lot of people have with the Theotokos, of how can Mary be <clears throat> sinless? If we believe that we inherit, that all of sin, we inherit the guilt of sin, then we end up with a problem with Mary. But as Orthodox, if we believe that we inherit death, the consequences of sin, Mary can die without necessarily volitionally having sinned. It's not dogma, but that theology that Mary was sinless is based upon this idea that she is not inheriting guilt, but she does inherit the death that comes about from Adam's sin. And that's why we have the assumption that she did physically die, like all of us, because she's a part of the fall and requires salvation, the deliverance from a death that we all do. This leads to a question too, is that for Augustine and for a lot of the later people, the problem is that God cannot just forgive. God requires satisfaction. That Adam offended the righteousness of God. We get this description of uh, consequences of sin. So mm -hmm. it seems that that uh, the the fall brings with it not just death, but bad, for lack of a better term, bad behaviors on our part, right? Sinful, quote, sinful behaviors on our part that are not uh, what God would, would want. If I was going to give a loose definition, death is separation. We talk about spiritual death, the separation from God. Um, physical death is that separation of the body and the soul. There's this element of separation going on in there. And I think as we look at death, um, there's a tight narrowness on the idea of physical death. You know, the whole issue of Christ's crucifixion, death, and resurrection. That gives a very narrow, tight definition. But there is also this broader definition of separation, this corruption that's going on that is at all levels, social, on up and down. Um, 
But in a sense, what this opens up is the possibility, and what you almost have is a universal salvation in Orthodox thinking. Christ in the crucifixion has eliminated the sins. God has forgiven us our sins, and he's destroyed death. Not just for those who believe, not just for those who are Christians, but everyone. That is a gift he gives to everyone. And in a broad sense, that is a part of the salvation that God is producing. Another way of looking at this, I think more to sort of what the slippery definition that you're looking at, is the church has also looked at salvation as a return to Eden, restoration. You talk, you know, Paul talks about the first Adam and the second Adam, these parallels that are going on. Um, but there's no ultimate return. God is not rewinding the clock. Things always move forward and get more complicated, and more interesting. What you start seeing is that this is a return to Eden, that this is a restoration of relationships. What was broken in the garden was the, rest, was the relationship of God and the creation, of them being close, being intimate with each other, God walking in the garden. The relationship of Adam and Eve was broken. Adam sitting there accusing Eve's the one who's caused this problem. He's separating himself from her over against her. And it's the separation of the creation, the visible and the invisible, being now separate, not really connected. So it's going to be, keep an eye on this, because you're going to see that there's a restoration going on here at all these different levels. And this, in a broad sense, is what our salvation is. In a more narrow definition, I want to get into some more technical perspectives of it. Um, it's a definition that doesn't so much come out of orthodoxy. I picked it up in my Reformed theology. Is they talk about salvation as being justification, sanctification, and glorification. Three steps to it. And while I don't hear many orthodox using this terminology, Orthodox thinking does fit within this framework, so I'm going to use it. Justification is another one thing that comes with multiple different definitions. It's believing in Christ, coming to faith, being baptized, entering into the covenant. It follows off of the Jewish concept of circumcision and entering into the covenant with God, that relationship with him. For us as Orthodox, we talk about being baptized. That baptism is the entry into this covenant, becoming a part of the church. And if you listen to the baptismal service, you'll hear the words, you have been justified. I know some Orthodox who will say, we don't believe in once saved, always saved. That we're not Protestant. I say we do. If you come into the church and you go off and become prodigal, committing all sorts of sins, becoming a heretic, denouncing your faith, and then you come to your senses and want to come back, what do you have to do? Hmm? Repentance and confession. You don't get rebaptized. Baptized is a once and for all. Baptism, justification, is a once and for all changing of relationship, of coming into the covenant, into relationship with Christ. That recognition of Him as our Savior, as the one who has overcome sin and death. And accepting that for ourselves personally. So this, it, the difficulty is that most Western churches, especially evangelical churches, focus on justification. As is justification is all of salvation. We as Orthodox have the opposite problem. We sometimes forget that we've been justified 
because we're focusing on sanctification. We're focusing on fasting, confession, ascetical efforts, charity, all these things. And we've got to be careful because if we confuse justification and sanctification, you'll get some really crazy conversations. We talk about being, by being saved by fasting. Most evangelicals are going to hear that we're trying to works righteousness. We're trying to appease God by our activities. It has nothing to do with God accepting us. We've already been accepted through justification. I'm going to skip over sanctification. That's going to be next week. Sanctification is what we call theosis, deification, a number of different words. That is, that takes a good bit of unpacking in its own right. But that is this process because our goal is not just to be forgiven. We're looking for restoration. We're looking for this bigger view of salvation. We're looking for how do we become like Christ? How do we become one with him? That resolving, that restoring of relationships, that being the key one. The third point is glorification. What comes in the future, the second return of Christ and beyond that? Oftentimes, it gets caught up in geographical language. Going up to heaven, down to hell, sheep and goats on the right and the left, geography. And also binary, either or type of terms. Um, the language is there. Luke 24, 51, Christ ascends up into heaven. John 3, 16, no man has ascended to heaven. And in Revelation, there's about a dozen references to this up-down type of notation. It's, it's there, but we need to be careful with it. Um, Revelation also talks about the bottomless pit, bottom going down. So there is this geographical language in Scripture. Jesus is the one who uses the, the analogy of the sheep and the goats. But if we lock into this, into a simple heaven and hell, I think we're going to get ourselves into a problem. And part of this is a problem Augustine then gets even better. He is dealing with a Greek philosophy term called eudomia, pleasure. And he's asking, what is the highest pleasure that you can have? Beyond just eating, beyond clothes and riches. What's the highest pleasure that you can have? The presence of God. Therefore, what is the worst thing that can happen? The separation from God. That is where this heaven with the presence of God, hell being the absence of God, gets started. And then a lot of common culture has picked up a lot from Dante, Inferno and Paradiso, of this sort of polar opposites. And the idea that hell is the place where God is not, or hell is the domain that, of Satan, that God has turned over to him for tormenting people. We get into trouble if we get into this and start thinking about presence, absence of God, binary, either or. Next week, I want to touch a little bit on judgment and the idea that God is a consuming fire and how orthodoxy plays with that theme to come up with a different view of it. What is the Christian vision of glorification? Sort of more the orthodox view. And I say the Christian vision because it is not just orthodoxy that holds this. Read C.S. Lewis um, and some of his writings. He is dead on target in dealing with this problem of uh, the great divorce 
is one of his key books on this. And he's struggling with the same concepts that we as Orthodox are struggling with. That he doesn't see this angry God rewarding some, punishing others. He has a different vision. And it's, I think, very close to an Orthodox vision. Pick up, I'm going to read a couple of passages, and some a little bit long. Um, taking what you've been hearing and see how this starts fitting into a different way of looking at scripture. Ephesians 2, for by grace you are saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. We often catch just the first two verses of that, not the third. But this all goes together. This is the vision that God had for Adam and Eve in the garden. You were created on two good works to do something. You have a mission, a job to do. But he has to sort of reset and correct things before we can get on with it. I'm going to read a bit of Revelation 21. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, and I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit of a great and high mountain, and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city has no need of sun, neither the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God enlightened it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no more night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall be no wise entry into it by anything that defiles, neither whatever worth it works abomination or makes a lie but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and the Lamb. And in the midst of the street of it, on either side of the river, there was there the tree of life, which bare twelve banners of fruit, and yields her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it. And a servant shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, be the light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. That's the vision of our glorification, what we look forward to. Loop back. I said about first century Jewish expectations. The Messiah defeats the enemies of God in Israel. What are the real enemies? Sin and death. Wasn't what they expected. But their understanding was correct at that point. The king returns to Jerusalem. Talk about the triumphant entry. Cleansing and restoring the temple. This is multiple levels of Jesus returning to the left temple, overthrowing the money changers. But he's also restoring the temple. And what is the temple? We are the temple of God. 
and the king is then enthroned. He's ascending into heaven to sit at the right hand of God. He comes back in the heavenly Jerusalem, in the middle of the city, enthroned as the temple. That first century Jewish understanding is right on target. But Christ changes it from quite the way they were expecting of a military con conquest at that time. Mm -hmm. But also, this should give you a little bit of caution. It says, like a bride coming down. He's talking here about a city. But who do we see as the bride of Christ? The church. The church. People. So before we go out and get our tape measures and grids, start trying to make a map of this place, I think in the same way that first century Judaism got it right but didn't get it right, if we jump into Revelation literally, it's not going to be less than literal. I think it's going to be a lot more than necessarily what we make it into be. Yeah, the tabernacle. We're talking about Jesus and such being the tabernacle. But Hebrews, we're the temple of the Spirit. So how does the body of Christ, are we in the city? Are we the city? Salvation gets quite complicated here. The leaves for healing. Wait, if this is glorification and death and all have been put away, what's there to be healed? I think there's some surprises still left here. I'm trying to give you, this is a big topic. And we need to approach it as something big. It's not just me and Jesus. It's not just, I've been forgiven, I have a fire insurance policy, and now I'm okay. This is a reset of the Eden Project. But in the same way Eden was a beginning that got derailed, the plans for something much more glorious, this has now gotten much more complicated, richer. It's now no longer a zoological garden. It's a garden city of the new creation being restored and put back together. And now a plan for us to do something with it. I want to give you three questions. As you encounter, as you're reading about salvation, looking at different theology, non-Orthodox theology, or anybody who's writing theology. There are three questions to keep in mind that will help you see problems and steer you straight. The first one is, does salvation require a change in God or a change in us? We are the ones who are fallen. We are the ones who need to be saved. It's part of the problem I see with Reformed theology, because the problem's in God. God is the one who was punishing us, who can't forgive until he's been satisfied. He's the one who needs to be changed, but we're the one with the problem. That's something that Annette has a hard time resolving, and I think a difficulty that Augustine got him into. The other issue, does a solution separate the loving Christ and an angry God? Does it separate the persons of God and basically split their nature? Or does it keep them unified? A lot of times in the Middle Ages, they were struggling with this problem. Is We have an angry God in the Old Testament, we have a loving Jesus in the New Testament. And then, oh, wait a minute, Revelation, Jesus seems to be pretty angry here. Maybe it's the angry Jesus and the loving Mary who bring us salvation. You start getting problems when you start trying to get one person of the Trinity having a different attitude than the others. Remember John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The Father 
is God being referenced there. It is not Jesus trying to appease the Father. It's the Father in his love for us who sends his Son on this mission to rescue us. They're together in this with the same attitude, the same love and compassion. And the third thing, does it isolate the resurrection from the incarnation and the resurrection? Or do you need all three pieces coming together? Not totally common, but I knew some Reformed theologians who saw the resurrection as merely a proof text that God accepted the sacrifice of Christ. That the resurrection was not necessary for our salvation. It was accomplished in his death. It's orthodoxy that wants to bring all these together. Christ becomes incarnate to become one with us, to save us. He dies to destroy sin, and in resurrecting, destroys death. It's the fullness. Questions? Thoughts? Yeah? Uh, might be a good idea to uh, start with like the purpose of creation that so that you know all of creation can come into direct communion with the perfect love of the trinity mm -hmm. and that and adam's fall was a cause was a change in the uh cosmic scope of everything mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. christ assuming humanity well he was always supposed to from the beginning incarnate to become like us so that we became more like god mm -hmm. and that his assumption of our humanity and then Subsequently, all the things that come with it, and then the death, and the descent into Hades, the being of death, resurrection. Mm -hmm. That was the recapitulating of us back to the Edenic state. Right? Mm -hmm. So God created us to be in communion with him, not to damn us. Right? Mm -hmm. So the purpose of creation is really important. You have to start with Genesis. It's a good creation. God doesn't make junk and throw it away when it breaks. What his purpose of creation was, it's hard to say. The fall came along so quick, it derailed everything really quickly. And that's, I think, hard. part of the difficulty of trying to figure out Revelation is it's going someplace, but it's not quite clear yet where that is. Thank you. Thank you. And next Thank week you. we'll deal with theosis and focus around that sanctification process.